From WBUR Boston and WRNI Providence, I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. The United States didn't see September 11th coming. In his book, Ivory Towers on Sand, Martin Kramer holds Middle East scholars in America squarely responsible for failing to read the warning signs. They sugarcoated the most extreme forms of Islamic fundamentalism, calling them democracy movements in disguise, he says. They studied moderate Islamic reformers, but not Osama bin Laden. This hour, a call for Middle East scholars to step out of their ivory tower and into the global political fray. After September 11th, America turned to its Middle East scholars to explain the history and the rationale behind the terrorist attacks. Hindsight may be 2020, but should academics have foreseen the lethal significance of growing antagonism in the Islamic world toward the West? Yes, Martin Kramer says, but it's no surprise that they didn't. In his new book, Ivory Towers on Sand, Kramer presents a scathing critique of Middle Eastern studies in America. Quote, it is no exaggeration to say that America's academics have failed to predict or explain the major evolutions of Middle Eastern politics and society over the past two decades. What gap do American intellectuals need to fill in the Middle East conversation? Do you believe they've had the story wrong? You can join the conversation tonight at 1-800-423-TALK. That's 1-800-423-8255. Joining us in the studio is Martin Kramer. He's author of Ivory Towers on Sand, The Failure of Middle Eastern Studies in America, and editor of the Middle East Quarterly. He's a visiting professor at Brandeis University. Good evening and welcome, Martin Kramer. Good evening. Also joining us tonight is On Point guest analyst Anthony Lewis, former columnist with the New York Times. Good evening and welcome, Anthony Lewis. Hello. Martin Kramer, give us the core of your critique of American scholarship on the Middle East. What is wrong in your view? What is wrong is that uh, scholarship is driven largely by a vision of what the Middle East should be and not what the Middle East is. Uh, it's a Middle East which we all would hope would be characterized by uh, Islamic movements which have moderated and which are willing to enter into politics on the basis of pluralistic tolerance. It's a Middle East where we would like to see the authoritarian regimes uh, set aside their ways and move towards democracy. This is what we'd like to see. This is what Middle Eastern scholars have thought they saw, but it's not there. You've been a visiting professor at University of Chicago. You've been at Cornell, Georgetown, now Brandeis. What's going on in your mind? Uh, why why do you believe that American scholars are, are, are getting the picture wrong? Well, there are many complex reasons. I would say that um, looking back over the past decade, uh, the main desire of Middle Eastern scholars was to place the Middle East in some kind of universal context. Things were changing elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. In Eastern Europe, um, democracy blossomed. Uh, the Soviet Union had fallen. There was change in Latin America. And many scholars in different political science departments across the land were going off to advise uh, governments on transitions to market uh, economics and to democracy. The Middle Eastern scholars were left at home in the course of the 90s. And I think what they did was to try to imagine that these same processes were underway. And when they couldn't see the forces that uh, would have moved the Middle East in that direction, they imagined them. And Islamic movements included um, as democracy movements, as movements which would carry the region to uh, a, a, a reform that um, would be broad-based and, uh, mm. and that would equalize the situation in the Middle East with that of the rest of the world. So you're saying in looking for the, the silver lining, they missed the, 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 the threat. They missed the Osama bin Laden camp. Oh, I think so. In the case of uh, in the study of, uh, of Islamic thought, there's no question that the great focus of Middle Eastern studies in the 1990s was looking for a great reformer of Islam, someone who would reflect in effect an Islamic reformation. Um, and large tomes were produced on the thought of a whole host of reformers. I'm sure you wouldn't recognize any of the names. Uh, Osama bin Laden was not considered a legitimate subject for, uh, for research. He represented the Islam that uh, no one in academia was prepared to identify with. They even regarded him as being, in a way, outside Islam and hence outside the, uh, the boundaries of legitimate research. It was left to terrorism experts, mostly outside academia. So you say this came about, in your view, partly because 
these scholars saw the great changes going on elsewhere in the world and felt a natural urge to look for comparable changes in the Islamic world. But is that enough to explain? You're, you're really describing what you see as wishful thinking on the part of academics. Academics are supposed to be trained in, in rigorous uh, collection of data and in rigorous observation. It must have been more than, than the, than the you know, party around the Berlin Wall that, that uh, produced this wishful thinking, if indeed that's what it is. What, what's, what's really going on there? Well, the deeper roots have to do um, uh, with um, ideology, I would say. Um, since 1980, 1981, um, it's been the argument of the new guild of Middle Eastern studies that the Middle East is not an exception. Um, that to posit the Middle East as an exception to the rule is really a form of racism. It's pejorative and mm -hmm. it's derogatory. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, if this is so then, and it's Orientalist, I should add, that is, it's a, it's a successor to a whole series of prejudicial views about the Middle East which have been held from the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. um, and so the whole project of Middle Eastern studies has been to show how the Middle East is like every other place. And it's been turned really into an ideological quest by scholars. Hmm. Uh, what we've seen, of course, is that in many ways the Middle East remains an exception. Hmm. It's probably more an exception today than it was 20 years ago when this wave started. And no one has accounted for that yet in the field. Hmm. Anthony Lewis, you've spent a lot of time thinking about the uh, Israeli conflict and the Middle East in general. Do you agree with Martin Kramer that uh, the U.S. scholars have got it so very wrong? I don't want to agree or disagree. All right. Um, I'd, <laughs> I'm, I'd, I'd like first, as in this first phase of our program, to ask Professor Kramer a, a, a question. Isn't there an element here, I'm just leaving aside the American Middle East Studies people for a moment, of people in Middle Eastern countries where the political system is political systems are not open, and they're, they're closed, they're tyrannical, and they're failed? and they're economically failed, isn't there a tendency for people to turn, some, some of them, to turn to Islamic parties and Islamic movements as just a way of getting out from under the official party, the official state which so suppresses them? Isn't that an element in this process? M Martin Kramer, you can give us your 10-second answer. We'll come back for the rest. It's one of one, many reasons people turn to Islamic movements. Um, the question is what the leadership of Islamic movements does with the following they then amassed. And I think that the Osama bin Laden is a worrisome example in that respect. Let's hold it right there. We've got to take a, a quick break. We're talking tonight with Martin Kramer. He's author of Ivory Towers on Sand, The Failure of Middle Eastern Studies in America. He says American scholars of the Middle East have got it all wrong. They've seen the region through rose-colored glasses, and we paid the price on September 11th. What do you think? Has America been well advised by the scholars who know the Middle East best? You can join our conversation at 1-800-423-8255. That's 1-800-423-TALK. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. .org. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. We're talking tonight with Martin Kramer, and we're talking about the state of Middle East studies in American academe. It may seem rarefied, but Martin Kramer makes the case that it is integral to understanding what happened in and to the United States on September 11th. If you don't understand a whole region of the world, you're not going to know when the missiles, when the passenger jets hijacked, are coming. What do you think? Is the American view of the Middle East dangerously naive or so harsh that it creates enemies? Are you confident that America's leading thinkers in the Middle East are telling it like it is? You can join our conversation tonight at 1-800-423-8255. That's 1-800-423-TALK. We're joined by Martin Kramer, a visiting professor at Brandeis University, and by our guest analyst this evening, Anthony Lewis. Tony Lewis, just before the break, you were putting the case, and, and, and Martin Kramer didn't really have time to, to respond fully, but that I guess you're saying haven't failed tyrannical political systems driven Middle Eastern populations to radical Islam. Uh, or to Islamic parties and movements. I don't know how radical. Right. That's, mm -hmm. that's what Professor Kramer was just beginning to answer. Right. Um, these movements are uh, no doubt born aloft on a, on a wave of resentments and uh, frustrations. Uh, but that doesn't make them democracy movements. They are populist movements. Uh, but we've seen uh, different populist movements uh, throughout history surging through, for example, Europe uh, uh, earlier in this century, which did have a broad base, but which were not oriented towards instituting democratic norms. And I think that's pretty much the characteristic of most of these Islamic movements. 
with I'd say very few, uh, very few exceptions. Um, the vision they offer is one of justice, not of democracy. Those are two different things. Uh, and I think that um, we have yet to see a movement emerge which carries aloft the f flag of Islam which was prepared to tolerate um, the kind of uh, uh, political pluralism which we're accustomed in the West. We've had on this show uh, some weeks ago Daniel Pipes, who I think was founder of the Middle East Quarterly, where you're now editor. And he made the case strongly. He said, George Bush is wrong to describe this as a war against evil. He said he should name and frame what that evil is. And he said the evil is Islamic, militant Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, that is strong medicine. That's a strong view. George Bush has, by and large, resisted that. Are you making the same argument here? And if so, is there a risk that by framing things in that way, we actually make enemies out of potential friends? Well, it's, um, uh, let's say it's, it's a, it would be a good operative conclusion to assume that those movements which have the United States highest on its target list are going to be Islamic movements. Um, uh, I don't know whether I uh, agree that it makes um, a diplomatic sense to put that on the table as long as it's understood in circles where it really counts. Uh, my feeling is that in circles where it really counts, that is understood. Uh, and that it does provide the agenda for the next stages in uh, phase two and phase three, or if there are f additional stages. I happen to think there actually there's a wider range of threats to the United States in the Middle East than Islamic movements. And so from my point of view, I don't know that I would necessarily uh, limit my definition of the threat uh, to uh, Islamic movements. I would include radical Islam in that, but I think that there are other threats as well, which could be uh, at some point just as worrisome. Martin Kramer, uh, I, I don't want this to sound uh, wrong, but, but it, it sort of in, with this large population of Middle East scholars, the question that, that begs itself is, you know, who are you to stand up and say they've all got it wrong, that they're all, they're all uh, you know, lost their glasses at the supermarket and, and I've got the clear view? <laughs> well, um, what I did in my book was really to take a couple of issues on which I thought the, um, uh, the failing was manifest and undeniable. There are other contentious areas. Anthony Lewis has worked a lot about Arab-Israeli issues. I did not deal with the Arab-Israeli uh, debate in my book because I thought that here there really were... There really is still room for difference of interpretation. But I thought that by the time we came to the year 1999-2000, the failure of Middle Eastern studies, both in, as you put it, sugarcoating Islamism and in manufacturing the idea that civil society was going to overwhelm authoritarian regimes in the Middle East, I thought that failure was manifest. And so I focused on those, on those two. Who am I to do it? I'm part of the Guild, actually. Uh, the guild meaning the circle of those who make this their life study. That's right, that's right. And I know it uh, from the inside. Uh, no one else really in the guild probably would take it on themselves. I've been uh, overseas the past few years teaching abroad. I've been um, um, uh, watching from a kind of distance. I call myself an intimate stranger to Middle Eastern studies, a product of it but not dependent on it. And so I allowed myself. And, and what do you think the consequences of this, uh, of this wishful thinking that you allege uh, have been and are for the United States today? First, let me correct you. I, <clears throat> I don't think that um, it would have been the job of Middle Eastern Studies to predict September 11th. Duly noted. Um, and um, I would say that um, uh, it might, it, it, if Middle Eastern Studies had been doing their job, um, they would have raised a red flag over the trends within Islamism that made September 11th possible. Um, they did not uh, decipher the handwriting on the wall. They did not uh, see that there was handwriting on the wall. I think they didn't even see that there was a wall. Um, and the whole trajectory of their interpretation went elsewhere. Let me give you just as a comparison um, with the Rabin assassination. Now, when Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated, in, uh, in 19, uh, uh, 1995, there was an array of Israeli scholars at universities who could say that in the previous four or five years, they had detected the possibility that among radical Jewish fundamentalists, mm -hmm. there would be a willingness to kill other Jews. Uh, and so when it happened, people in academe in Israel were uh, shocked but not mm -hmm. surprised. Mm -hmm. September 11th, the situation here was completely different. People were shocked and surprised in academe because the entire trajectory of Islamism was predicted to be moving in a different direction, away from confrontation, towards accommodation, marginalization of violence, and that didn't happen. Mm. Martin Kramer, uh, Tony Lewis would like to come well, in. I, I just was struck by something. Um, 
Professor Kramer, you said you had deliberately avoided the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict in, in the book, and yet I've noticed that in this country um, you have written in and been supported by uh, journals that are very strongly identified with Israel and, and uh, we could say the conservative or right-wing side in Israel, the Weekly Standard, the Wall Street Journal, uh, and other such magazines, and they seem to be <laughs> sort of moving you into that uh, conflict and saying maybe they're saying that the uh, Middle Eastern scholars that you criticize are insufficiently pro-Israel. Is there something to that? I, maybe I just don't understand it. Um, you know, when you write a book, you assume it'll be read in a certain climate and, and by certain readers. I wrote this book before September 11. Hmm. I assumed it'd be read mostly by people in the field. Uh, not by people outside the field. And yet, here you are tonight. And here I am tonight. The book has different readers, and it gets different readings. Um, I found that lots of people have taken an interest in the book who I never imagined would. There are people who are, for instance, education conservatives, uh, who believe that this is a proper wedge uh, to, um, to influence the course of academia generally. They're the people that, that, that you mentioned. I've even found that it's been, uh, that it's been quoted and cited by people on, um, um, who have strong religious convictions. Uh, and, and a grudge to bear against academia. I didn't really write the book for those people. <laughs> but that I, begs, that begs uh, Tony Lewis's uh, question, uh, doesn't it? Uh, do these affiliations indicate that you have a particular stance on Israel that informs your larger view? Uh, well, why, perhaps my larger view informs my stance on Israel. I mean, it's... <laughs> well, yeah, well, uh, speak uh, to it either way, uh, please. Um, look, I, have, I have an aversion to the tendency... To, um, to focus in on someone's position on the Arab-Israeli conflict and judge everything they say subsequently mm -hmm. uh, on that basis. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the real weak spots of Middle Eastern studies generally, the pigeonholing. Mm -hmm. People get put in boxes. Um, my, ten my, my inclination is to look, at, uh, look at, a, at a text, look at an argument, and judge it by its merits. If something is published by the Institute for Palestine Studies, I don't immediately dismiss it. I read it and look for the, uh, uh, for the validity of the argument, and there are things sometimes which I read which are written by people who write in, in that journal with which I agree mm. in whole or, or, mm. or in part. So I, would ex I expect the same courtesy from others. Martin Kramer, Anthony Lewis, stand by. We're joined now by Joel, Joel Bainan. He's president of the Middle East Studies Association, professor of Middle East history at Stanford University. Welcome and good evening, Professor Bainan. Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us. I think you've heard a bit of our conversation here, and you surely are aware of Martin Kramer's thesis that the American Middle East Studies community has missed the boat, that it's, that it's been uh, trapped by political bias and wishful thinking and seeing democratic reform where there was no such thing going on, and boom, we have 9-11. Uh, he doesn't draw the line directly, but it's not hard to, to feel that running through the book. What's your view of this critique, Professor Joel Bainan? Fundamentally, I would say that uh, Professor Kramer may or may not be right in his characterization of certain individuals, but I think he's uh, incorrect in attributing uh, these views to the Middle East Studies uh, community as a whole. Um, there certainly were, for example, many, many people, including people who he criticizes prominently in his book, uh, who have been warning that there is great anger, unhappiness, even disgust with the foreign policy of the United States mm -hmm. among uh, Arabs, Muslims, and so on. Um, I can recall uh, a lecture, for example, by Rashid Khalidi, one of my predecessors as president of the Middle East Studies Association and someone who comes in for some fairly sharp criticism. Uh, in Professor Kramer's book as having said as much. Mm. In the summer before September 11th, Shibli Tilhami, who's a political scientist at the University of Maryland, yeah. published an op-ed on the in the New York Times summarizing some public opinion research he had done in Egypt, Lebanon, United Arab Emirates, and two other Middle Eastern countries in which the strong drift of anti-American sentiment was quite evident. So it's simply not the case that uh, people in Middle East studies, all of them, uh, didn't didn't understand that so, this was happening. So, at some level, you would flat out deny that 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 the awareness was not made clear by this community. Is there any sense in which you would agree with Martin Kramer that the American academic community around Middle East studies let the country down in in conveying a full and accurate picture of what was going on in the Middle East pre nine eleven? 
let the country down? No, I don't think so. I might agree that, uh, for example, John Esposito's approach to understanding contemporary Islam has some flaws in it. I would certainly agree that uh, the, the notion that civil society was about to happen in the Middle East in any kind of Western liberal sense was flawed. Uh, but these views were not the views unanimously held by people in the Middle East Studies Association. What scholarship is about, after all, is an open debate, and uh, some of the views that Professor Kramer uh, says were held by people uh, in one form or another uh, were held, but there were others on opposite sides. Uh, And more fundamentally, uh, the reasons that Professor Kramer adduces for people having had these views are utterly and totally wrong. Mm. It, it, Professor Bainan, Joel Bainan, do you see a, a, any danger here that in taking the tougher attitude toward Islamic militant Islam that Martin Kramer does, that the United States, through through the agency of its uh, scholars, could actually drive Islamic populations further into the fundamentalist radical camp and create enemies where there need be none? I I wouldn't put it exactly that way. Um, What I would want to emphasize, and perhaps this is one of the things which Professor Kramer objects to, is there is a great diversity of opinion among the various Islamic movements. They are not all the same thing, and they are certainly not all Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. Uh, One needs to delve very particularly into the histories of particular places and to examine carefully the social bases of various movements and their various ideas to get some sense of what they're about. Now, doing that doesn't necessarily mean that they are, in fact, going to be about Western-style liberal Mm -hmm. democracy. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they won't be, Uh, but I think it's fair to say and important to understand that neither are they all about Osama bin Laden. Martin Kramer, a, a courteous Joel uh, Bainan, responds that you, you have picked and chosen from the writings and works of American academics and, and I guess misrepresented this group in saying that it had an overall bent toward uh, wishful thinking or too much optimism about democratic uh, uh, reform flourishing in the Middle East. Well, I think that um, um, Professor Bain perhaps is uh, right to point to one or two voices that expressed uh, other views. My impression is that the field is a good deal less diverse than uh, than he indicated. Um, there are, of course, no views which are unanimously held in Middle Eastern studies. There are in the Middle East Studies Association 2,600 persons. That's why in my book I focused on people who tended to be leaders in the field, people who often were elected president of the Middle East Studies Association, including a name mentioned here, John Esposito. I don't want to mention other names in the course of the, uh, uh, of the evening. Um, my complaint is that the field is not sufficiently diverse, that we don't hear enough voices, that there isn't enough debate. It is a small field. You know, the Modern Language Association has 40,000 members. This is 2,600. In a small field, there's always a propensity and a danger uh, of... A, of a um, um, a guild-like evolution, which makes it difficult for people to express differing views. And my impression over the past 20 years is that it's gotten more and more difficult to do that. Civil society, by the way, was not something engaged in by a small number of, of scholars or interested enthusiasts. The, no, the notion that it might be developing in the Middle East. The, right. This was, this was the major project. There was lots of outside funding for it, by the way, to do it. And uh, anyone who was anything in this field had their finger in this particular pie. Martin Kramer, Joel Bain, and Standby. We have a lot of callers who want to join us. Let's invite them in. Saeed is calling from Buffalo, New York. Welcome, Saeed. You're on the air. Yes, uh, good evening to both professor of university. I'm originally from Iran. All right. And, and I've been in this country 22 years. Mm-hmm. The University of Michigan, when I came to 1978 to study on my graduate work, has a huge uh, uh, inventory uh, of the books written about the Islamic scholar. I do have some comment regarding of Professor Kramer's comment about the Islam. So, so what's, your, what's, what's your view in a nutshell, Saeed? Not, my, my, my view of nutshell is for past 20 years, people are concentrating on this Islamic fundamentalism movement, which is a copycat of the Christian fundamentalist in the United States. 
And has that been well? Of, is that, of, let me finish, please. I'm sorry. Rise of rise of people like Pat Robinson, Jerry Powell uh-huh. in this country created the same situation in the Middle East because American government decided, hey. If the fundamentalism is going to win in this country, let's apply it to other countries. So, so, so I, I want to be sure I understand, Saeed. Are you saying that American scholars were too focused on Islamic fundamentalism or yes, not, fo- they not focused on... about the fact that oh. for past 2,000 years, there is wars. When Ottoman Empire fighting with Persian Empire during Islamic era, we had what we call the Persian Empire used to have, which I'm from that area of the mm-hmm. world, Shia sect, and Ottoman Empire was Sunni. Sure. And these two religious were going to fight. That's reason Ottoman Empire never moved toward East because of the Persian Empire. So scholars in this country, they keep forgetting. And unfortunately, the scholars are coming from my country or Middle Eastern countries. But what is, what is it that they're forgetting, Saeed? What they're forgetting is the fact that the Islamic fundamentalism doesn't exist in the Middle East. It's just the names... There are minorities groups. The populace does not support these people. If you go to the main, popula- main population, mm-hmm. even the uneducated, the people mm-hmm. that we make a, a big deal out of them in Pakistan and say they go to Madaris. Madaris is the name for high school. If, if you translate Madaris, which is an Arabic word, if these two scholars they know, is a high school. You teach the books. The, the books that you're teaching in Madaris is the Quran. Because Quran encouraged uh, liberty. Every time Muhammad took over any type of nation, mm. create the most democratic society. The Middle Eastern scholars for past 25 years, they're trying to portray in this country the Islam as a rigid, uh, a rigid uh, religious. Said, we've got to go, but I think you've got your point. You're saying Islamic fundamentalism maybe isn't so bad, I guess. We're talking about the Middle Eastern Studies group as a whole and their view of the Middle East. Has the U.S. been well served? You can join us at 1-800-423-8255. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. We'll be right back. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. We're talking tonight about the American view of the Middle East as shaped, as framed by the scholars on Middle Eastern studies in the United States. Our guest, Martin Kramer, says they've had a kind of love affair with a dream of a democratizing Middle East that just isn't so. And he suggests that that view took the entire nation, has taken the nation, into peril. What do you think? Has America been well advised by the scholars who know the Middle East best? Joel Bainan, I know we don't have you forever. I want want to give you a a last word here on on, on this debate. What's really going on here? What's really at the heart of of this debate, Professor Bainan? Well, at the risk of being a little bit tendentious, um, I think what's at the heart of the debate, despite Professor Kramer's demur, is the Arab-Israeli conflict. How so? Um, what happened in the Middle East Studies Association and among Middle East scholars more broadly was that modernization theory and economic development theory, Mm -hmm. which came from outside Middle East studies, Mm. unlike what Professor Kramer claims in his book, were brought into the field. And they basically argued that the Middle East is going to develop along the trajectory of Western Europe and North America. Mm -hmm. And the civil war in Lebanon in 1975, the Iranian revolution of 1979, which brought Ayatollah Khomeini to power, uh, and the protracted Arab-Israeli conflict showed that that was not the case. Now, those theories were promoted by people uh, who are intellectually and politically in some cases the polar opposite of the people that Professor Kramer is mainly criticizing. And so when those people were younger, uh, they began to search for new interpretations of things. And many of them drifted uh, to various social history interpretations uh, at first, and not at all to the views of Edward Said, who Professor Kramer in his book. But take us to the Arab-Israeli conflict. Evil. Take us to the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict connection. We're, 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 we're the great and washed, and we're waiting to hear how that figures in. Well, the way it figures in is that among the critiques that were developed in this period of the late 70s and early 80s was a rather more critical approach to the Arab-Israeli conflict and to the American alliance with Israel and to Israel's treatment of the Palestinians. Mm-hmm. And that went along with, I mean, it didn't necessarily go along with, and not to the same extent for everyone, but it 
accompanied a generally more critical approach to older ways of understanding the region, ways in which Professor Kramer was trained and still maintained. Are you suggesting that Martin Kramer's view of the world depends on seeing the Arab world to some extent as not capable of development or as intrinsically dangerous? Wasn't that essentially what he argued before I came on, that the Middle East is the great exception to the rest of the world? The rest of the world is having democratization. We're seeing the economic mm -hmm. growth. That's not happening in the Middle East. So there is a certain insistence. Now, I wouldn't dispute, of course, the actual facts of the matter. Certainly, the most of the governments in the Middle East are quite authoritarian. The level of economic development is rather pathetic and mm -hmm. so on. The issue is, why are these things happening? Jo is, Joel Bainan, I, uh, are they happening because there is something intrinsically mm -hmm. wrong, defective about Islam, Arabs, so on? Mm -hmm. Or are there more social history type explanations mm -hmm. for these things? Mm -hmm. We're circling around some pretty important stuff here. Joel Bainan, I want to thank you very much for joining us tonight. Professor Joel Bainan is president of the Middle East Studies Association and professor of Middle East history at Stanford University. Thanks a lot for coming on with us. You're very welcome. We've got a lot of callers who want to join this conversation. Let's open up the lines. Bill Beeman is calling from Providence, Rhode Island. That's a name I know. Good evening, Bill Beeman. Hi, good evening. I'm glad to be, uh, have a chance to chat with you. Um, you, as you may realize uh, uh, that uh, Martin Kramer's book uh, I re uh, on uh, attacking the Middle East uh, studies community yes. uh, and the Wall Street Journal editorial that, uh, that really derived from that book caused a great deal of controversy within the association itself. And Bill Beeman, we should identify you as in the field at Brown University. That's correct. I'm a Middle East specialist at Brown. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, uh, that Joel Benin uh, is absolutely correct. I've been, for one, uh, warning since, uh, uh, really since the 1980s about uh, the rise of terrorism in the Middle East and linking it specifically to American policy. Uh, I had uh, two or three uh, editorials in the New York Times which specifically said this. So you don't agree that the American academic community somehow let down the home team? Well, I don't know. I've been I've been advising the State Department. I've been writing for the New York Times. I've written for uh, the Nation for other publications. I've been speaking quite widely, not just myself, but also uh, many of my colleagues, on precisely this. What uh, Professor Kramer does not want to hear, mm. and what uh, what uh, Dan Pipes, who is allied with him, also does not want to hear, is that the United States itself bears a responsibility for the rise of this terrorism. Uh, of this, this terrorist movement. Are, are you looking back to the support for Mujahideen in Afghanistan or something else? Well, I, we've got to, I, that. That, of course, is one. That is uh, that's one aspect of it. Of course, we did uh, support the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. In fact, created the conditions which led to the establishment of the Al Qaeda movement. Uh, and uh, we also supported the Taliban, for heaven's sake, mm -hmm. before we uh, before they actually became uh, our uh, our enemies. And the uh, this uh, this is one aspect of it. The other aspect is the uh, is the the situation which led to the establishment of a military presence in Saudi Arabia, something that uh, that all Middle Eastern scholars warned against, and that the British uh, declined to do for for mm -hmm. decades and decades and decades because they knew how dangerous it was. Mm. Bill Beeman, we we're grateful to you for coming on. Our time is running down, but thank you very much for for bringing your your two cents into the conversation, Martin Kramer. Uh, Joel Bainan says, hey, it wasn't as bad as you suggest. People did describe a range of situations and uh, suggest that behind your critique somehow is, the again, the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, Bill Beeman as much as says the, the same thing. How do you reply? Well, the problem with, um, with the argument is this, that um, these very same people in Middle Eastern studies have been complaining about U.S. policy in the Middle East since time immemorial for 20 years. So there really was no change, mm. nothing that was suddenly run up a red flag. Uh, so I find it curious when people come and say, well, of course, it's, it's been U.S. policy. Uh, this has been the case for a long time. And the fact is that um, the very same people who were critical of U.S. policy were often apologetic on behalf of Islamic movements. Mm -hmm. so there's, no, there's no contradiction between the two. The same people who said U.S. policy was a problem were the same people who were, um, who were saying that Islamic movements were moving towards reconciliation and accommodation. There was a contradiction there. Mm. Anthony Lewis, what do you hear in this debate, in this conversation uh, among the, the scholars of our nation <laughs> around the Middle East? Well, some of it is 
recherche to me, <laughs> and there are <laughs> wheels and wheels here. But, I mean, I do think we're still circling around the Arab-Israeli dispute, the Palestinian-Israeli dispute. Boil that down for us. How do you see well, it reflected? I, I simply know that in many Islamic countries, television every night shows scenes of a Palestinian child being shot by Israeli soldiers, mm. of uh, houses being bulldozed down, Palestinian homes, and the women crying over their lost possessions and lost homes. And the power of that as an element in Middle East feelings can, simply cannot be overlooked. And as uh, we almost just heard but mm. didn't quite hear it, mm -hmm. United States unflinching support, not just for Israel as such, which is entirely appropriate, but for the policies of the Sharon government, which have bottled up people in their villages for more than a year, which have assassinated a great many people, and so on. Of course, people may react against that and think the United States is not their friend. Uh, isn't that true? I, I just it seems logical to me. Martin Kramer, we've just got 40 seconds left, but you hear, the, you hear Anthony Lewis's view. The problem with uh, that view... Uh, and I describe it as one of two, for homing pigeons. You know, you can release people's minds everywhere from the Hindu Kush to the High Atlas, and they wind up on the esplanade of the Dome of the Rock. Mm. What, it, what, explains, uh, what explains Afghanistan, Iran, Sudan? The Islamic trend goes far deeper and broader than the Arab-Israeli conflict. It may be that the Arab-Israeli conflict is a cause for some of the sympathy that an Osama bin Laden might muster, but not for the terrorism itself, and not for these Islamic movements, which are so widespread and broad-based. Martin Kramer, Anthony Lewis, we're not going to solve this uh, debate tonight. I hope it hasn't been too tendentious, but, uh, but we made a stab at it. And uh, it, it's, it's illuminating to see how the, the folks in the Ivory Tower look out on this world that we all live in. Martin Kramer is author of Ivory Towers on Sand, The Failure of Middle Eastern Studies in America and a visiting professor at Brandeis University. Thanks very much for joining us this evening, Martin Kramer. Thank you. And Anthony Lewis. Uh, he of the longtime New York Times column and, uh, and, and this evening among us, and we're very grateful for it. Thanks so much for being with us. Anthony Thanks Lewis. to you.